morning, everybody. Sorry, scrambling a little bit right there. All of a sudden, I realized I'm supposed to be up here. Good morning. Welcome. Glad you joined us this morning for our indoor service. And uh, everybody that is watching the online stream, welcome uh, being with us in that way. We're glad you joined us as well. And uh, I'm Chris, if you don't know me. So, uh, catching my breath. As always, if you want to stay connected with us, remember you can find all the info that of going on, things changing and everything through the website and through the Facebook page, so stay connected with us there. Um, if you don't know, we have this nifty Church Center app that you can search for. It's called Church Center and it's connected to all of the uh, Planning Center online stuff that we use here for everything, for our database and for uh, registering for things like this service that you went through and stuff. So actually even easier maybe than going through the website when you registered and stuff. If you have the Church Center app, pull that up on your phone and um, you can actually register for the services, RSVP and stuff that way and see the events coming up and things like that. So we wanted to remind everybody that we have that Church Center app. So check that out. Um, for our weekend services, as you have all figured out, we're doing this 9 o'clock indoor service. Uh, we're back in here. We're going to continue to be doing these as long as it is not... Uh, the county's not in red or purple or whatever, right? So if we're in yellow and orange, we'll keep doing this. We're going to keep doing the outdoor service here uh, at least through the month of September, and we'll kind of see what's happening with weather and numbers and all that stuff, and, uh, and the online stream every week at 9 o'clock. So we'll keep doing that. We need you to RSVP. So this is not just for you guys here because you've figured that out, but for people watching online, if you want to join us for the 9 o'clock indoor service, we need you to RSVP just to make sure that we have capacity for everybody and uh, can get everybody you know, seated and distance and all that thing. So you can sit in the sanctuary, you can sit down in the fellowship hall, uh, we even have the little chapel area if somebody needed air conditioning. Um, we are doing kids ministry um, and, and we're following all the guidelines there as far as kids staying distanced and just 10 in the room and things like that. So only so many places for that. Register um, each week starting Monday morning at 9 all the way till Friday at 5.30, but we have to have that cut off so we can, can be prepared. So if you can remember to do that, 9 a.m. starting tomorrow morning, register for next week's service, or join us for the outdoor service at 10.50 every week. Um, you've probably all mostly figured out the thing. Just so you know, you're gonna see some arrows around the building. Try to just follow the direction of the arrows. Um, if you have any questions, holler at somebody. But if you do need to use the restroom from the sanctuary, you can head out this side, down the stairs, find the restrooms. And um, if you're down the fellowship hall, Aaron will help you down there. You'll be good. Um, let me think if there's anything. Oh, at the end of the service, if everybody would just stay seated, then uh, Alex or myself will come and just dismiss you by row real quick just to keep, uh, keep the traffic flow going well there. And if you have kids that are in kids' ministry, when we let you out at the end of the service, you'll just go through this way, back this hallway, make your way to the kids' ministry uh, area, all right? I think that's all the deets I need to work through right now. Oh, one more announcement. We're having a baptism service here in a couple of weeks, September 27th, an afternoon outside thing over at uh, Grace Fellowship Church on um, East Straub Road. They have a really cool setup out there with a pond and everything. So we're going to do an outdoor uh, baptism service. We already have several that are signed up to do that. If anybody else would like to talk to us about baptism, register for that. You can register through the website now. Um, say something to us this morning. If you want, even just want to talk about what's baptism mean, do I want to do this right now, we'd be glad to help you with that. So um, that's September 27th. If you want to get in on that this week sometime, we'll need to hear from you so we can make that happen. All right? All right. My breath is mostly back now. It's good to see you all this morning. Let me say a prayer for us, and we'll continue to worship. Father, thanks so much for a new morning. Even if it is a rainy morning, it's good to be together this morning. Thank you for uh, all of these broken pieces for our Mosaic family, whether here inside, at home, watching online, at the parking lot service later. Uh, we're just thankful that we have a church family that we can continue to grow with and connect with in various ways. And uh, we just continue to ask for your leading as we move forward. And this morning, Lord, would you lead us and um, God, we just look to you, our, uh, our Prince of Peace this morning, our, our loving Father, um, Holy Spirit who guides and teaches us. We look to you and we invite you this morning. Would you help us to hear from you? And um, Lord, 
we just want to worship you this morning and, uh, and be thankful for the good and loving God that you are. So um, thank you for joining us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
has gone before us Still he never leaves our side It's like our God
tells me so Jesus loves me still today Walking with me on my way Wanting as a friend to give Light and love to all Sing it out said something profound that sometimes hard for us to grasp. As you described the kingdom of heaven being revealed to mankind, you said, Father, I'm glad you have not shared this or revealed this to the wise and learned, but in fact you have revealed it to children. And Father, I, I think of the simplicity of our last song and, and how how desperately you love us, how you envelop us, how you nurture us and keep us and call to us. And, and may, we, um, may we receive that love this morning. May we bask in that love this morning. And then as recipients of that love, may we um, express it well to others. In the contrast of a broken world, may the world see the peace that transcends understanding and, and hearts that glow with hope and um, reflect your love. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, all. How are we this morning? Too somber. How are we doing this morning? Are we, are we good? Awesome. Have a seat. Have a seat. We um, have been doing this study in um, 1 Peter 3, and I'm going to take a little bit of a detour. So if, you've, if you're going to be following the notes, the notes are more for... The, this particular week, the notes are more for what, what it is you can do throughout the week with them, and I would encourage you to do that. Today, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at this specific text, and we're going to be looking at it for the purpose of encouragement, but I'm going to take a little bit of a detour. So turn to Philippians chapter 2, first and foremost, if you would. Philippians chapter 2. Now, it's interesting. You know, as we look at go eat popcorn, right? Go eat popcorn. Go. Galatians, Ephesians. Philippians chapter 2. You know, when, when we read 1 Peter, the, 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 there's a recurring theme through the entire letter. 
And it doesn't seem very encouraging when we see it. And it's the fact, it, it's the fact that Peter, that tiny little, this tiny little letter of Peter, which is just five short chapters, Peter mentions suffering 12 times. Let me say that again. He mentions suffering 12 times. In all of Paul's writing, if we think of the vast majority of the New Testament and all the epistles, and, and all of Paul's writing, he only mentions the word suffering seven times. The question might be, why in the world is Peter focusing on suffering? What is he trying to do here? Part of it is a recognition of, of, of the world around us and what it is we're going through and what it is we will go through. Part of it is he's got a shepherd's heart. So I want to talk a little bit, just a moment about the contrast between Peter and Paul's ministry. Jesus in John 21, it says that, um, actually turn there real quick, turn there. Keep your finger in Philippians, turn to John 21 for one second. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, da-da-da, John, da-da-da. You want me to lead in worship? Probably not. You ready? Boy, it's hard not to walk the aisle. You ready? All right, here we go. I'm going to pray before we read this. Father, we thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy. We thank you, Father, for your, for your attention and your affection. We thank you that you love us as children and you, you draw us to yourself. And Father, help us to see, Lord, what your intentions are. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in John 21, we're going to start at verse 15. And, it, um, and they, um, they've had breakfast with Jesus, is what's just transpired. And Peter, who had denied Jesus three times, is now kind of nervous about being with Jesus. And we start at verse 15. He says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? This more than these phrase could have to do with the disciples themselves. It could have to do with his fishing tackle and what he did for a living. It could have to do with his passion for, for, for what he did vocationally and, and what he had done with his friends. He says, yes, Lord, though, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. You know my affection for you. Jesus said something. Look at what it says. It says, feed my lambs. Look where he starts. The tenderest, the most vulnerable, the least initiated, those who need the greatest care, the, greater, the most supervision, and the most protection. Stop there for a minute. Why would Peter talk about, why would Peter talk about through his entire letter, five little chapters? Why would he mention suffering 12 times? I don't know that as Peter wrote the letter of 1 Peter, that he wasn't, what, was he, what he wasn't doing was thinking back to this moment. Here he is near the end of his ministry now, and he's writing a letter of encouragement to all who, who he knew, the scattered throughout. And he's writing this little note, and he's saying to them, listen, this world is really brutal, and you're going to suffer, but let me tell you something. Rejoice in that suffering because your father is doing something magnificent in you. He is refining your faith. He's proving it to be of greater value than gold, gold refined in fire. So as your faith is refined in the fire of suffering, recognize this is your Father's plan for you. It's his intention for you. Did God bring about the suffering? No. But he knew there would be suffering in this world. And so as Peter is writing this note to all the scattered sheep, all those, what does a shepherd do? A shepherd, a shepherd certainly watches the flock, but Jesus said something very profound in the hearing of Peter. What good shepherd doesn't leave the 99 and go off to find the one? And when he has found the one, he, he, he puts it on his shoulders, he brings it back, and he rejoices. How does Peter start First Peter? If you were to go back and look, it says, to all who are scattered, to all you sheep scattered. So he says, Jesus is telling him, Jesus is not only reinstating him to the relationship that Peter's denial had broken, but he's also instating him to what it is that he would do. And the description to Peter as to what he would be would be a shepherd. And the first mentioned are lambs. Feed them. Do you love me? Yes, you know I love you. Feed them. Feed my lambs. Take care of them. Take care of my sheep, he says in verse 16. Again in verse, uh, down in verse 17, he says, feed my sheep. Three times Jesus speaks to Peter and says to him, you will be a shepherd over my flock. You will be. 
your heart tenderized toward those that are precious to me. This is a really important moment for us to recognize when Peter is writing, and he's writing about suffering, he's saying to the scattered sheep, listen, this world is difficult. This world is broken. This world is not your home. You are an alien. You're a stranger here. You're a sojourner moving and weaving through it. The great shepherd who Peter follows, Psalm 23, he leads me on paths of righteousness right through the valley of the shadow of death. And, be, and because you are with me, God, I will fear no evil. The great shepherd. So, G, so P, Jesus is, instating, is, is, is establishing Peter's heart for the sheep, his responsibility to the sheep. And so when he writes this letter in 1 Peter, he's saying, listen, all of you who are scattered, there's a shepherd who loves you and who will leave the 99 to come and get you. And there's suffering in the midst, but we are here and Jesus is here. Remember who you are. You are a holy nation. You are a royal priesthood. You are the people of God. You are part of this grand flock, these living stones built into a living temple that houses God himself. This is the message of Peter. This is his message. This is the one he received from Jesus. He watched it in Jesus' life. He had heard the 23rd Psalm recited. He watched the shepherd come. He was then encouraged and instructed by the shepherd and then commissioned by the shepherd. And now later in his life, as he reflects on all of that, as he looks with a broken heart to the sheep that are scattered, he wants to remind them, listen, don't forget who you are and don't forget whose you are. And realize, yes, there will be suffering, but the great shepherd is enfolding you, and he has you enfolded, and he rejoices in you. I'm convinced that that's why Peter wrote this little note. I'm convinced that this is what he had in his head when he wrote it. I'm convinced that's why he's saying to the sheep, yes, this is hard, and there is suffering. But that suffering's producing something in you. It's producing a faith that is purified and deepened. It's producing the character of Jesus as he's revealed in you through the process. It's drawing you in to be part of this holy temple, this living temple that houses God. And now, as you're encouraged in it, in the midst of the suffering, I want to use you to bring more sheep into the fold. So, um, actually, go, go to First Peter now. If I decide to go back to Philippians, I will. But we're going to start at 1 Peter 3. And we're going to start at... Um, we're going to start at verse 8, if I can. So here we go. He says, finally, now he's, he's speaking. He's, he has is, he is encouraged and reminded us who we are and whose we are. And now he's working through the, all the things in life that we are going to experience. Those, those, those uh, four kind of stations of life where he speaks of being a good citizen and, and the authority over us in that context. And then a good employee and the authority that is over us in that context. Then he speaks the idea of, of what it is to be married and how we're to submit to one another. And he talks about these and he, and he expresses concern and then he gives us instruction. Now he says in verse 8, he says, listen, he says, finally all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic and love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Don't repay evil for evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you were called, so that you would inherit a blessing. Whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his le lips from deceitful speech. Speech that would bait others into, into uh, difficulty, into argument, into doubting. He must turn from evil and do good. He must examine his life and express it in a way that expresses the very goodness of Jesus in them. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. He is next to them. He walks beside them, and their hearts are interconnected. And his ears are attentive to their prayer. And who are the righteous? The righteous are those who have received Jesus, who the Spirit is in, whose nature is now the same as that of Jesus, and now who are longing to walk according to that righteousness. And as we walk in righteousness, as we are now considered children of God, we are, we are drawn to him and his ears are drawn to our prayers. So he says, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, those who would separate, those who would push against, those who would create an environment that is unsafe. 
Now, keep your finger here. Go back to Philippians chapter 2 just for a moment. I want us to see something, and I want us to see it in the context of contrast. So how are we to live in this world of suffering? How are we to do this? Well, in Peter, he says, we're to live, we're to live in harmony with one another, or to, be, to express sympathy and compassion for one another, joining, the, joining our brothers and sisters in their pain, commiserating with them and, and working through it. We're to love one another as brothers would, and we're to be compassionate and humble. And not, not repaying evil for evil or insult for insult. Now, what I want to do is I want to go to Philippians 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 12 for a moment. He says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Continue to recognize who you are in Christ and to make and to walk the walk with him, to engage with him. So we're to walk out our, our, our salvation with fear and trembling. And this word fear has to do with being reverent to, toward God. We're going to look at that in one more second. And that trembling has to do with the recognition of being in the presence of holiness, being, being possessed by holiness in the Holy Spirit, and recognizing the grand privilege we have to be children of God and to live it out accordingly. For it is God who works in you. Why, why should we, we be in reverent fear and awe and trembling? Because it is God who works in us to will and to act according to his good pleasure. So when we surrender to him, when we walk with him, we allow him to speak to our hearts and we join him in that righteousness, he will do what? Work out his will and he, will, he, um, he, he is the one who uh, works in us to will and to act in according with his good purpose. In other words, he enables us to live out a righteousness. According to his will, he now acts on us and he shows us how to act and empowers us to act the right way. So what is this? He says, do, so do everything without doing what? What's that next phrase? Without complaining or arguing. Without evil speech or deceitful speech or derogatory speech or speech that would divide. Speech that, that is, is, um, is uh, less than harmonious. So he says, do everything out of, uh, out of uh, do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault, in a crooked and depraved generation. And so he's speaking to us in regard to our sojourning and being aliens and strangers here. He's saying you are far different than the, what the world is, and you're supposed to be. So allow God to work in you, to accomplish his will in you, and to act through you. How? Well, Peter would say harmoniously compassionately, graciously, lovingly. So he says, do everything without arguing and complaining so that you may be blameless and pure in a position to be used, a vessel of noble purposes. Peter says, listen, when we cleanse ourselves of sin and we repent, we make ourselves vessels of noble purposes, vessels that God can fill and use to accomplish his will. So do everything without complaining and arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. Now, why does he say that? Because he wants to give us the contrast. The contrast of who we are now compared to what we were in the world and who we are now compared to that which is in the world. But the purpose isn't to create an us versus them. That's not the point. Where we, where we recognize who we are and who's where and we become haughty for it for any reason. Or we look down on others for their lacking. No, what is he saying? He's creating a contrast. He's letting us see where we were and what it is we're called to, what it is he's made us, and how he wants to use us. And when we allow him to use us, when we put ourselves in a position to be used, continually repenting of that which was worldly in me, spending time abiding in his word and prayer and fellowship and worship, and giving him, being mindful of him consistently as I enter into every circumstance, he's saying, listen, I want to show you a contrast. When you live this way, when you live as the body harmoniously, when you have compassionate for one another and you commiserate with one another and you care for one another and you walk through these circumstances with one another, when you do that, you're like, look what it says. You are like stars that shine in the universe. We shine like stars in the universe. Why, what's the deal? You know, when the sun comes up, the stars don't go away. You know that, right? It's not like when the sun comes up, all the stars scatter, Right? No, they're there. And so what we need to recognize is how he puts context to the stars. He's saying when, when the sun descends and darkness 
over, envelops the earth. What happens in that moment is stars begin to what? Shine. They begin to shine. They stand in stark contrast to the darkness that is around them. That is what our lives are like when we walk with Christ. And when, when, when we function in a harmonious fashion, when we're compassionate for one, with one another, when we are compassionate toward one another, when we're willing to walk through difficulties with one another, when we, when we remind, remain mindful of God in the circumstances of the day, we begin to shine like stars in the universe. We now stand in contrast. Our lives ought to stand in contrast. So he goes on and he says, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children without fault in a, in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. Now, let's break the us and them. So he reveals the contrast, but he doesn't stop there. There's a purpose for the contrast. Look what it says next. And this will set us up for what we're reading next. Look what it says. As you hold out the What? As you hold out what? What's it say? As you hold out the word of life. As you hold out the gospel of truth. As you hold out the mercy and grace of God. As you hold out that which has transformed you. That which is now in you. That which you are living in such a way as to allow to shine through you. You're holding out life. We are now in contrast to the world, not for an us versus them thing. Not for looking down on somebody in a haughty fashion. Not for saying, look what I am but for being able to say, look who he is in me. Look what he has done for me. Look what he's doing with me. And would you like some too? This beautiful contrast is so that the world can see us shining and the glory of God shining through us. This is why in Corinthians it says that God's power, his incredible power, is in jars of clay. So that when that power is seen, it, the, it's not the jar that, that is emphasized. It's that the power that is in us. It is the person that is in us. It is the grace that has been bestowed upon us. But when does this happen? When we live in contrast. When we individually live in contrast and when we together live in contrast. So let's go back to 1 Peter 3 again. Where did I end? Do you guys remember? Was it at the end of 12? So verse 8 says we're to live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate. Re don't repay evil for evil or insult for insult, but with blessing. How contrasting is that with the world's conduct? When we will be mindful of God, recognizing that all suffering is in the hand of God, not, given, not because of God, but in the hand of God, and we, being mindful of God, recognize what he's going to do in and through the suffering. We can now stand back and even, be, even have evil tossed at us without, without returning it. We can be insulted without having to return it. Look what it says. It says, do not repay evil for evil or insult with insult, but blessing. Return this with blessing. Live in contrast to the, how, how the world conducts themselves. You are not part of this world any longer. You are a child of God. He is indwelling you. He has given you hope, and the privilege you have is to walk with him and on his behalf. So look what it says. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. And what is that blessing? Certainly, it's communion with God. But if I understand Hebrews 12 correctly, it says, the joy, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. And we're to have that same attitude. So fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who in his case, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For us, it's for the joy set before us, we endure our suffering. We endure the suffering. Peter speaks of us joining in the sufferings of Christ and be able to see through the sufferings with joy. Well, why? Because we see an eternal purpose that God is working. And we see what he's taking and making good for the, for, the, for the sake of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. And what is his purpose? That we as his, would become his children and as his children would bring more children. That he would be seen in us and glorified through us. 
And so living in contrast is this. It is finding, being mindful of God in our circumstances. How, no matter how difficult the circumstances is, we see through them, looking at Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, we now imitate him. Who the, for the joy set before him, he endured suffering. We now can do the same. And the endurance of that suffering sometimes is when evil comes against us or insult comes against us, and our flesh wants to rise up and pay it back. Give it back to them. What did Jesus do when insults were hurled at him? Nothing. He didn't say a word. When he was unjustly tried, what did he do? He did not defend himself. When he was hanging on the cross, he said, I could call down legions of angels. But did he? No. He did not avenge himself, but he entrusted himself to his Father's hand, knowing that God's will and intentions in eternity are, are, will be accomplished in the midst of suffering, through the suffering, as he, what? Entrusts himself to him. That's being, he was mindful of the Father. And Peter is calling the sheep now to be mindful of the shepherd. Mindful of what it is he's doing. And, he's, and he knows full well there will be suffering, and there is suffering. So let's finish the text. So if we go all the way down to verse 13, 13, look what it says. It says, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? And that good is God prompted, God, God directed the character of Jesus in us good. When we want very badly to bring the kingdom forward and to treat people with dignity and respect, that Jesus might be seen. And the phrase, the phrase he uses here is, why would anyone want to harm you if you're eager to do this thing? But there's a caveat here. He reminds us of something. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Even if you should what? Suffer for doing what's good. Suffer for bringing righteousness forward. Suffer for bringing the truth of God's love. You know why? Because that's what's going to happen. As eager as we are to win, what's happening in the heart of the sheep? It is having deep compassion for the lost. It is desperate to see somebody bathed in sin be dragged out and cleansed by the blood of Christ and given eternal life. And we suffer that. And we suffer that. And when we watch our loved ones continue down a road of destruction, what, what, what is in us? This deep desire to do what? Good. Which is compelled by whom? God. In Christ. Through us. And we bring that forward into the lives of those who are being lost and they, we, what do they do so often? They reject it, which does what to our hearts? Breaks them. What he's saying here is, listen, you're going to bring goodness and righteousness forward. You're going to, give, you're going to unveil for people by your living in contrast, shining in a star, like a star in the universe. You are going to bring this life of contrast, the life of Christ into a dying and dark world. You are going to be, your heart is going to be desperate as you watch them walk a road of destruction, the same road that you were on and somebody rescued you from. You now so desperately want them to know what you have that you'll do anything to give it to them. And they're going to reject it nine times out of ten. And what will that do? Cause suffering. And sometimes that suffering is going to be pointed at you. Not merely the fact that they would reject it, but now that they might persecute you for it. That your life and righteousness is reflecting on them in such a way that they might hate you or hate your actions or hate your position or hate your person or hate your language. And Peter is saying this is going to happen in this world. It's going to happen. So he says, Who are you, who's going who's to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Don't fear what they fear. And that, what he's actually saying here is don't fear the fear they bring. That's what he's actually saying here. They're going to come up against you. Don't be frightened by that. Don't be frightened about what they might do. Jesus said something really profound in this context. He said, don't fear the one who can harm the body or even kill the body. Fear the one or revere the one who what? That once the body's dead, can take the soul and cast it into damnation, into hell. Fear God only. Revere him only. Recognize he is both the giver of life and then the judge of life. So it goes on. But in your hearts now, look what it says now. Do not, so Peter now is taking what Paul said about doing everything without arguing and complaining that we might live a life of contrast. Peter's telling us how to live the life of contrast. He's going to actually instruct us here. Look what it says. Don't fear the world. Don't set that fear on the throne of your heart. In other words, don't be controlled by it. Don't allow, your affection, don't allow your attention to be exclusively drawn to it. Don't be distracted by it. Don't be obsessed with it. 
Don't allow it to rule your life. Don't allow it to dictate your steps. Don't allow it to keep, you know, to keep you from going where you're going, to stop you in your tracks, or to cause you to run back. Don't do it. Don't fear the fear they're trying to instill in you. Don't be frightened. Instead, do this. Replace that. Now, anybody ever get afraid? You ever afraid? Ever? You ever have a moment where you're going to have an opportunity to share, share your faith, and all of a sudden you poop your pants? And you go, oh, right? Listen, it's because oftentimes our flesh is afraid. We are afraid. Well, what's the point in all this? Peter's saying, listen, don't let that stop you. Don't let the fear that they're trying to instill in you to frighten you and to keep you from doing what it is you need to do. So there needs to be a transaction that occurs here. Anytime we're fearful or anxious, essentially what we're doing is we're putting our concerns, our troubles, what's attacking us, what's in front of us, our circumstances, on the throne of our heart. It gets all of our attention. It has all of our thoughts. It has all of our, um, I would never say affection, certainly, but it certainly has our devotion. Anyone here ever devoted to the anxiety in their mind? Anybody? What I mean by that? That when anxiety comes, we what? We dwell on it. Zing, 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 zing. Well, we're devoted to thinking about it. So Peter is saying something really important. He's saying, take all that stuff, remove it. But you can't remove something from the throne without something getting on the throne. And the last thing you want to do is then put yourself on the throne. And so he says, listen, what you need to do is you need to expel whatever is on that throne, whatever is fearful, whatever is frightening, whatever is keeping you from moving forward, whatever it is that's drawn to your attention, whatever it is your eyes are fixed on. And the writer of Hebrews says, now fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Paul says in Colossians, he says, raise your eyes up and look into the heavens to see Jesus, to see the right hand of the Father. Stephen did that while he was being stoned, practically. What is Peter saying? He's saying, now take Jesus and put him on the throne of your life. Boom. But he says it in a very important way for us to recognize. Look what it says. It says, but in your hearts, in the seat of your affections... The root of your belief and faith. Look what it says. In your hearts, do what? Take Jesus and set him apart from everything else. He is not to be entangled with anything. He is not to share his affection with anything. He is not to share your devotion for anything. He is, he is not just one voice that you are to listen to. One set of eyes that you are to look into. One, he, he, his is it. He, not just one, but the one. And so look what it says now. It says, but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. As What? As Lord. Do you know this phrase is built around another phrase? You know what the phrase is? In Luke, Jesus is teaching us how to pray. And what does he say? Say it with me. Our Father who art in heaven, what? Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. You know what Peter's reflecting on right here? That. Because this word in the Greek, this phrase comes from that word. Lord Jesus, hallowed be your name. What is Peter saying? This Jesus is God. Sent by God for the purpose of saving you. He is now indwelling you by his spirit, who is God. This stuff around you ain't what? God. Unless you make it God, little g. Unless you let it sit on your heart to draw your attention, to draw your affections, to draw your devotion, to draw your thought life. He says, no. The writer of Hebrews says, no, fix your eyes on Jesus. Paul earlier says, listen, no, you, what you need to do is stop arguing and complaining, stop being distracted by those things, stop seeking vengeance, stop, no. He says, what? He says, listen, what you need to do is focus on Jesus who will cause you to what? Live in contrast. So Peter says, you do this together, you, you, you excommunicate complaining and arguing from your life when you live in harmony. Band, go ahead and get in place if you would, please when you live in harmony, when you allow his compassion to flow into you and through you, when you choose to do what? Bless, even though there might be an insult. To bless, even though somebody might be an evil. To bless, even though there might be conflict. To bless, even in the midst of the most difficult circumstances. To bless, even when you do not agree. To bless. That creates the contrast. And then as we continue to move forward, God says this, Peter says this, he says, listen now. I remember when I had denied my Jesus because I was afraid of men. I remember that moment. I remember the moment I denied him three times. I remember when men sat on the throne of my heart. And then there was a moment that Jesus restored me to himself. And when he restored me to himself, my heart changed. Read his sermon in Acts chapter 1. 
And now as a shepherd looking back on that, he's saying, listen to me, guys, I've been there with you. I know I've experienced this. So fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Look what it says, and we'll close this. He says, now, don't be frightened. Don't be frightened of the fear they're trying to instill in you. Don't be stopped. See through it. Be mindful of God. Keep your eyes right there. And set apart Christ as hallowed, as God, as king, as Lord, as master, as the lover of our souls and the shepherd of our souls. In your heart set about Christ the Lord and be, look what it says next. It's the exact same thing Paul says in Philippians. These are the stars shining in the universe as you hold out the word of life. Let's look what it says. But in your hearts, this throne set apart Christ is hallowed and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give you the reason for the hope that you have that has caused you to live in such contrast. And when you do this, do it like Jesus would, with gentleness and respect. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your loving grace and your loving mercies. We thank you for your incredible love for us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have, you have spoken to children and you have given us hearts to respond. We thank you for the privilege of being stars in the universe. We thank you for the power to live a life in contrast. We thank you, Lord God, for the compassion that you have spilled onto us that we should now spill onto others as we fix our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before her, himself endured the suffering, scorning its shame. May we now do the same. Fixing our eyes on you, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, a part in our heart is hallowed, revered, our God and King. That we might now live such a life that it shines like a star in the universe and people would see it and come and ask, where is this King of glory? Where and how he is, has he been born in your heart? Share with me the hope you have that causes you to live in such a way. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one. One day be restored And they'll know we are Christians By our love, by our love Yes, they'll know we are Christians By our love We will walk with each other We will walk right there yes our love for you but also it's profoundly our love for one another our willingness to live in such a way to 
reflect your mercy and your grace toward us, your compassion, that in the midst of conflict or the midst of differences or the midst of circumstances that we would love as you have loved us, that we would, being mindful of you, see through all the stuff and live in such a way that's in such contrast with the world that we shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life. May we set you apart as hallowed in our hearts and then be prepared to give a reason for our hope when asked. And may we walk with gentleness and humility. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful week, guys. We'll see you next week. Hey, hey, am I on? Yeah, just a reminder, hang out for just a second. Alex, is, you're going to dismiss him? Okay, he'll come through and dismiss you. Again, if you're picking up kids in the kids' ministry, you'll go out over here behind.